Good morning. I am Vanda Foma Brown, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution and Director of the Brookings Initiative on Non-State Arm Actors. Welcome to today's conversations about Mexico's midterm elections and the implications for US-Mexican relations. On Sunday, June 6, Mexican citizens will vote in the midterms to select the Chamber of Deputies of the Mexican Congress and 15 of the country's 32 governorships. At stake is whether uh, President Andres Manuel López Obrador and his party Morena will be able to retain a majority in the Congress, which currently, in which he currently enjoys absolute majority in the lower chamber and simple majority in the Senate, and thus be able to continue with his transformative agenda on his campaign and uh, which he laid out as uh, president. These elections are taking place uh, as uh, President uh, López Obrador seeks to redistribute wealth uh, to the poor uh, and focuses on inward looking economic nationalism, has pulled back from uh, some of the economic liberalizations policies of his predecessor, and also has um, attempted to recentralize power in the office of the president. For him, this is all part of the fourth revolution of the transformation of um, Mexico's uh, institutions to uh, uh, eliminate, reduce what he calls the, the power uh, of the mafia, or the mafia of the power, the uh, institutional economic political establishment and empower uh, poorer segments of Mexican societies. Critics, however, worry uh, that um, uh, what we are witnessing in Mexico is weakening of checks and balances. Uh, President López Obrador has repeatedly criticized a variety of uh, institutions and civil society actors in Mexico, including uh, independent media, universities. Uh, he has uh, also threatened institutions such as the Transparency Institute, the National Electoral Institute, uh, and has adopted a whole variety of changes uh, regarding the Mexican uh, judiciary and independent branch uh, of power in Mexico, including recently extended the um, uh, power of the president of the Mexican Supreme Court, who is also the head of the Federal uh, Judicial Council that sets um, uh, careers advancements uh, and uh, direction, uh, carries and advancements for Mexican judges and direction for uh, Mexican judiciary. So a very powerful, important institution. Meanwhile, the Mexican economy is facing uh, critical changes, suffering uh, from the greatest economic downturn in decades. The government's response to the COVID-19 has been more hands-off, uh, described by some as meek and inadequate. And of course, criminal violence in Mexico continues unabated uh, at extraordinarily uh, debilitating levels. We have a, a fantastic uh, uh, set of speakers today to discuss these issues with us. I am delighted that we are joined by Dr. Lorena Becerra, a political analyst and head uh, of the public opinion research for Mexico's, uh, one of Mexico's leading newspapers, La Reforma. She has two decades of experience uh, in uh, researching public opinions, both in the private and public sectors in Mexico, including in the office of the presidency of, Felipe Lope, of President Felipe Calderon. And uh, Dr. Becerra also has been an editorial writer in La Reforma, uh, Animal Politico, and other newspapers and magazines uh, in Mexico. We are also joined by Dr. Pamela Stard, uh, who is the uh, director of the US-Mexico Network and a professor of practice uh, of international relations and public diplomacy at the University of Southern California. Uh, Dr. Starr is uh, one of the most renowned analysts of Mexico and US-Mexican relations. She has uh, advised both the US government uh, as well as uh, Mexican government and um, um, frequently uh, participates in vital debates on US-Mexican relations. I'm also delighted to uh, be able to uh, have uh, um, uh, Ambassador Arturo Sarokan join us today in uh, the debate for many reasons, in the discussions for many reasons, including because Ambassador Sarokan is a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. Uh, he is the president of Sarukan and Associates, 
and was a Mexican ambassador to the United States. Uh, he holds a variety of other um, um, uh, positions, such as associate uh, fellow at Chatham House and distinguished visiting scholar uh, at the uh, University of Southern California, an under public diplomacy school, among many others. Ambassador Sarukan was a career uh, diplomat, uh, having held various positions uh, in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Mexico, uh, uh, being a crucial member of the diplomatic team that negotiated uh, NAFTA in 1993, and then also uh, played a key role in the uh, campaign of President Fed uh, campaign of then uh, candidate Felipe Calderon, and later was appointed ambassador by President Calderon. And finally, it is uh, an enormous pleasure to uh, introduce also Ambassador Earl Anthony Wayne, who is uh, a distinguished diplomat in residence uh, uh, at the American University School of Foreign Service and a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, where he co-chairs its Mexico Institute Advisory Board. Uh, he holds uh, many other affiliations. I just want to note that he is um, also um, uh, a co-chair uh, on the board of the American uh, Academy of Diplomacy. Ambassador Wang's distinguished career, like uh, Ambassador Sarokhan's, replete with numerous awards, um, included uh, Ambassador uh, Wayne's appointment as ambassador to Argentina, uh, as a deputy US ambassador uh, in Afghanistan, and US ambassador in Mexico, of course. He was also assistant secretary of state for economic and business affairs at the, in the US um, uh, State Department. And uh, in 2010, uh, the US Senate confirmed him as career ambassador, the highest rank, the highest award a US diplomat can achieve. Uh, so an absolutely terrific, extremely knowledgeable team that uh, I am delighted uh, that we will be able to uh, enjoy listening to and engaging with today. Uh, Dr. Bercera, let me please start with you and um, uh, ask you to give us uh, your latest take on what's happening with the polls, where the um, uh, midterm seems to be heading, what's happening with predictions, uh, what are the prospects for uh, Morena and uh, President Lopez Obrador to maintain uh, the absolute majority in the lower chamber and its implications uh, for how the, um, how the um, elections are likely to uh, turn out. What are the trends that we are seeing? Over to you, please. Thank you very much. Hi, Vanda. It's a pleasure to be with such a distinguished panel today. I, I appreciate the invitation from Brookings Institution and from Vanda. Um, I have a, a very small presentation because I think it's important uh, because of the size and the complexity of this election, just to, to, to illustrate some of the factors that are going to be playing into the minds of voters and the regional dynamics that we're going to be looking at. So I'll try to um, go through it briefly. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yep, okay. So what's at stake, uh, aside from many, many of the, of the important points that you, that you mentioned, um, it is basically Morena's uh, power to reform the constitution that we are seeing at stake in this election. Also the strength of President Lopez Obrador during the second half of his term. Basically this this election, aside from being a midterm election, it's the, the largest election in the history of our country because of all the state and local elections that are taking place at the same time. So this is the largest episode of political redistribution that is going to be happening during Lopez Obrador's term. So that's why his, a, a great part of his strength will depend on the result of this midterm election. His strength, towards the second half of his, of his term. Um, also the possibility of the opposition to regain territorial and political strength. If, as you can remember in 2018, the, the traditional party system became practically obliterated with the 53% uh, vote that Lopez Obrador got and with the huge supermajority that his party and its coalition obtained in the lower chamber. Uh, so this is a possibility for the opposition to start gaining traction again. And this towards the 2024 presidential election. As many of us know in Mexico, in Mexico, right after the midterm, the president starts becoming sort of a lame duck because everybody starts talking about who's going to be his successor. 
So, so this is very important. And the size of this election is just, you, you, you mentioned it yourself, it's the renewal of the entire lower chamber of Congress. With, for, for the first time, we are seeing the possibility of re-election, Mexico in history for the congressmen. We have to see how that plays out because congressmen in Mexico are still not that well known by their constituents. They still have not formed that huge base of support. They're still very dependent on their party. So we have to see whether they start forming these links with their constituents. 15 governor races out of 32 states and some of these states are very huge and the importance of these states economically and regionally are, is, is, is tremendous. Like Nuevo León, like Querétaro, Chihuahua, Sinaloa, Sonora. Some of these states are states where we have seen important uh, threats in terms of insecurity, like Michoacán, for instance, where the narco has displayed itself uh, for, for, for decades now. Um, so, 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 so these are very important elections. We also have 30 local congresses that are that are going to be uh, elected. Um, in order to reform the constitution, you need 17 local congresses. Morena right now holds more than that. So we have to see whether Morena still has the power to keep all the different phases of, of reforming the constitution, including the local congresses. And we have 1900 municipalities, 30 states are electing their municipal leaders. Only two of them are not, which are Durango and Hidalgo. And this is very important for Morena because this is the local, the local most election, the local more uh, uh, most segment of government. It's the closest to the elector. The voters know who their municipal president is. They are attentive to this election. And Morena performed very well in 2018 in the municipal elections. So that's why all of this is important. So, so what we're seeing is a tension between federal and local variables. Basically, when we have presidential elections, we see coattails towards the local elections. They influence powerfully on the local elections. But because of the size of this election and all the factors that are at play, we have huge potential for inverse coattails. And some of the reasons that we can we, that we can think about this is first of all, Lopez Obrador is not going to be on the ballot like he was in 2018. In 2018, just the, may, the, the mere presence of Lopez Obrador in the ballot had a homogenizing effect on the entire electorate. We saw him um, with landslide victories across states, regions, across age groups, across gender, across social classes and educational levels. Right now, that homogenizing effect has been diluted. And we are seeing, we're going back to the pre-2018 scenario where vote, the party, the party, uh, the vote intention for the party is cutting across educational levels again. We are seeing huge rejection towards Morena from the more scholarized sectors. We are also seeing differences in age and gender, uh, and gender gaps in, in de de several different states. And the regional differences that due to be very important part of the Mexican political system are becoming salient again. And this has to do with the fact that it's more of a, of a local election that we are holding. And because Lopez Obrador is not going to be on the ballot, even though he tries to be present every day in his morning conferences, and he's trying to do a lot of things that are stepping over the law, he's still not gonna be on the ballot, right? Another factor is because Morena is not as strong as Lopez Obrador, it has never has been. It's, it's a vote in 2018 was 39% as opposed to Lopez Obrador, who is 53%. So Morena has to fend for itself without Lopez Obrador, right? And the national electoral districts, I'll go into, into that briefly, where Morena is strongest are not having concurrent governor races. So that complicates the scenario a little bit more for Morena. Some of the important trends that we see is that the ruling party traditionally loses votes in the midterm election. So these are the votes where each of the presidents, the former presidents was elected, the part, the vote that that's, that president's party got in the presidential election, and then the votes that, that 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 party got in the midterm election. And we have seen how all of these parties, excepting for, for the PRI with Peña, with, for the PRI with Peña, they have all traditionally lost votes in the midterm election. This is a trend that we see, and this has to do basically with the erosion that they suffer for governing and because they are held accountable for the mistakes uh, of the president, in spite of the fact that most of these presidents 
had good approval levels when they went into their midterm elections. Actually, Lopez Obrador's approval rate today, which is around 60 to 63 percent, is not historically uh, salient. It's not it's not an outlier. It, ha it, it was similar to the approval levels of Calderon and Fox in their midterm elections. They both lost their midterm elections. And Peña Nieto, who had uh, like around 29 to 30 percent approval rating at, in, during his midterm election, didn't perform that badly. And that was precisely because of the local movement that we saw with the PRI governor, uh, the governors and the alliances that they formed with the Green Party. So there is no guarantee that the approval level of López Obrador is going to translate into Morena votes. And this approval level is not any outlier historically in a historical perspective. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is that 2018 was an exceptional race. Morena and its allies, so the country is divided in 300 districts. Morena and its allies won 218 out of those 300 districts and 43.5% of the national vote. This was something that we hadn't seen before the PRI, uh, like a ho ho the, 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 the hegemonic era of the PRI. This was huge. Um, and the rules of overrepresentation resulted in that super majority, right? In order for a party to have 50% plus one of the lower chamber, they need 42.2% of the national vote, which Morena exceeded with its allies in 2018, and 167 districts. So here Morena has to defend that differential, 51 districts, right? It has to defend in the entire country, which in my opinion proves very complicated because of what I'll go into next. Um, the recent decision of the electoral tribune to enforce the rules of super of overrepresentation are going to my, make a difference, in my opinion. In the law, a party cannot be overrepresented in the chamber by its vote by more than eight percent. And when we, I'll show you the composition where we have this was this was a huge overrepresentation. If these rules are enforced, as the electoral tribune decided a couple of weeks ago then Morena is also facing some trouble. Um, many of the states where Morena won the majority of the electoral districts are, are very competed right now, uh, either because they have competitive governor races or because Morena has performed very poorly in their governments, like Veracruz, Morena, and Puebla. Um, so we expect some vote of punishment in those states. There's also a natural tendency in Mexico for increased turnover at the municipal level. So all of these factors can hurt Morena and can help the opposition. And as I was mentioning before, because this is a local election, the, the governor and municipal figures are more important than the national uh, figures, the congresspersons. People don't even know who their congresspersons are. This is the percent of municipal turnover historically since 1979 to 2018. As you can see, it's just a trend. Traditionally, people in, in, in many, in, in most districts, in, in, in most municipalities in Mexico, we see municipal turnover up to 66%. This plays against Morena. The PAN and the PRI have also defended their turfs in their post-2018 local elections. We have seen them performing fairly, fairly well like Tamaulipas, Coahuila, Hidalgo, Aguascalientes, and they have maintained their electoral machineries. We are seeing those machineries in action today. Um, the three new parties that are looking for registry are drawing votes from Morena, most of them, and the determinants of vote in Mexico also play against Morena, which are basically the issues that the people focus on, which are economy, security, health and COVID have become recent issues. And the president is poorly evaluated in all of these issues. And Morena is even worse evaluated in their local leaders in these elections. This is just an, a, 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 a historical trend of the issues that, that, the, that the population is concerned about. And as you can see here with Lopez Obrador, we started seeing a very important concern for security, but now we have a concern for security, economy, and COVID and Lopez Obrador is not well evaluated in these issues. This is just to show you what happened in 2018. 
uh, Morena got 39% of the vote and it today holds 51.2% of the seats, just Morena, right? But when we add this coalition, which is the PT and the, the Partido Encuentro Social and sometimes the Green Party that is now going in alliance with Morena, that is why more, it had such a huge overrepresentation after 2018. If the, the electoral rules of overrepresentation are enforced this time, we can expect the Congress to resemble the national vote more than it did in 2018. And let's keep in mind right now that the vote intention for Morena is around 39 to 41% at the national level. Um, the PAN and the PRI are still between 19 and 17, and Morena allies are between 3 and 4%. So Morena is definitely going to need the alliance, at least with the Green Party, to have an absolute majority, in my opinion. And the constitutional majority is basically close to zero possibilities for Morena, the two-thirds majority in the lower chamber, because of all these factors that we're talking about. And this is a 2018 elections. All of the districts, these are, these are the states where Morena won all of the local districts. So this was just a huge trend that we saw in, in, in Mexico at that time. Right now, we are not seeing that. We are seeing that these, these are the, the, the national districts, the circunscripciones, where Morena, uh, I'm sorry, where the, where the country is divided. The 300 districts are grouped into five huge circunscripciones. And Morena is mostly strong in circunscripciones three and four, which are down in the south and the southeast of the country. But the rest of them are very, very competitive. Uh, uh, terrific comments. Can I please ask you to wrap up uh, the initial presentation in yeah, about a minute? Yeah, I am finishing. I'm actually finishing. This is the next slide. The governor races are not concurrent with the district, with, with the circunscripciones where Morena is strongest. As we can see, this is where Morena is strongest and most of the governor races are happening in the circunscripciones where Morena is more competitive. I'm sorry, where Morena is finding more competition and where the other parties are more competitive. And what we are seeing here in the projections for the local races is that Morena is probably going to perform very well in around seven states, but the rest of them are very, very competed. And this is going to have an effect on the congressional election. And that this is because we are, we are seeing is the inverse coattails from the local and the state towards the federal districts. Sorry if I extended myself, but that was about it. Thank you very much. Terrific comments. And I look really forward to um, a conversation among all of us about some of those uh, dynamics that you outlined. You know, I was um, struck by the three issues that um, you uh, uh, said voters are now paying attention to voting on the economy, security and COVID, which is, of course, hardly surprising that would assume well, one would assume those would be the primary issues. Yet for a um, considerable amount of time, uh, President Lopez Obrador was nicknamed the Teflon president and seemed to be able to get away with um, uh, poor performance uh, uh, in all those three issues. Uh, with that, let me uh, turn to you, Professor Starr, um, to give us your take on what has happened in the past two years. Um, are those uh, three issues that voters are voting on indeed the issues that dominated the first two years um, of uh, the Lopez Obrador administrations? What are some of the key most important developments um, that uh, have taken place so far. Thank you, Vanda. Um, actually, what I want to do is, is talk about this in sort of a, a with broad brushstrokes, as opposed to looking at the specifics of individual um, policies. Although I will talk a lot about individual policies as well. Um, I want to expand more on what's at stake at the June sixth election because Vanda, both Vanda and Lorraine have talked a little bit about that. Um, but I want to emphasize a little bit more that when we're looking at the national level election, what's going on in the legislature, um, and uh, not so much what's going on obviously in the municipalities where, um, as we know, it's much more local factors that come into play, but particularly when we're talking about the legislature, I think what's at stake is nothing less than the future of Mexico. 
um, voters are choosing really between two competing visions of Mexico uh, and its future, between López Obrador's fourth transformation and to a certain extent, a return to the policies that preceded it. Um, part of the reason for this, that this division is so profound in Mexico is the fact that López Obrador's government has had some real policy successes during its first two and a half years in office, as well as extremely significant shortcomings. So the opponents of López Obrador tend to look at his successes, which makes it hard to understand why half the Mexican population tend to have pro López Obrador electoral preferences. They tend to, they're leaning toward either Morena Verde or the Labor Party. Um, meanwhile, López Obrador's supporters tend to underestimate the importance of his shortcomings. Um, and as a result, they tend to interpret opposition to some of his policies as complete intransig intransigence, as a complete unwillingness to accept any change at all in Mexico. So let me look at these policy successes and, and, and shortcomings. And so we can see how these two attitudes about López Obrador have really hardened um, in Mexico over the last two and a half years. In terms of his successes, um, López Obrador is the first president in living memory to emphasize the wants and needs of the majority of Mexicans who live in some form of poverty. Um, we have to admit that this is quite different from, from what came before him. Governments traditionally focused more on the wants and needs of the political and economic elite, assuming that this would benefit the rest of Mexico as well. So this has included some very important policies that embody these promises to put, put the poor first. It's included a universal pension for senior citizens, benefits for the disabled, a whole series of social welfare programs designed to directly address the needs of disadvantaged segments of society, and a 60% increase in the minimum wage. There have also been other important successes. Um, these include increased tax collection on large corporations who owed back taxes, um, secret ballots for union elections, which is something that's brand new to the Mexican union landscape although implementation on this has been a bit slow and, and, and uneven. There are other successes that supporters of López Obrador will point to, but let me just leave it at that in the interest of time. Um, but there are also some very important shortcomings um, in, in terms of the policies that López Obrador has implemented. First and potentially most important for López Obrador in terms of what he's promised his, his, his supporters is there's been a huge increase in poverty. Um, in part, this is without a doubt due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We see similar numbers throughout Latin America, but it's also reinforced by two policy decisions on the part of Lopez, part of Lopez Obrador. First, um, he decided to um, have a very, very limited response um, to uh, the COVID pandemic, a very limited fiscal response. And as a result of that, about a million co companies went into bankruptcy and about 2.5 million jobs were lost. Now, some of those jobs have returned, but estimates are that it will take years for Mexico to recover fully from this crisis and a decade for poverty to return to its 2018 levels. Second, this poor performance in fighting poverty also reflects the dual purpose of López Obrador's social welfare programs. They not only provide assistance to neglected segments of society, but at the same time, they're designed to generate a permanent base of support for López Obrador and his fourth transformation suite of policies. And as a result, many of the programs are poorly designed in terms of fighting poverty. They are negatively affected by clientelism. And according to the Federal Audit Agency, there also appears to be corruption in a number of them. Another negative outcome of López Obrador's fourth transformation policies has been a significant drop in investor confidence in Mexico due to a lack of respect for private property rights and contractual rights. This will inevitably reduce further future investment in Mexico, both foreign and domestic investors, and therefore limit future growth. Equally troubling are López Obrador's attacks on key independent institutions of democracy, including but not limited to the National Electoral Institute and the judiciary. Here the aim seems to be to eliminate obstacles to López Obrador's ability to freely implement his fourth transformation policies. This has translated into aggressive efforts to eliminate the independence of the Electoral Institute and the judiciary, particularly the Supreme Court, it seems he's, focused, he's, he's clearly focused on now. And in the process, he's undermining their role in protecting both democratic uh, practices and democratic governance. López Obrador has also expanded the role of the military in society after having repeatedly promised in the past that he would do just the opposite. 
They are in civilian construction now, constructing in particular uh, an airport and, and some rail lines, but they're also operating ports. They now run the customs um, agency and they replaced a civilian police force as the lead agency fighting organized crime and violence. And in part for that reason, um, there's also been an increase in crime and violence and insecurity in Mexico. So there's lots of room for both supporters of Lopez Obrador to point to legitimate advances that have benefited their interests and for his opponents to point to legitimate failings that have indeed harmed their interest and potentially the long-term growth trajectory and democratic trajectory of Mexico. Which means that the election boils down to, at the national level, do you support or oppose Lopez Obrador? And that's the way Lopez Obrador is reading it. As Lorena correctly noted, this is about his ability to change the constitution and to thereby be able to more effectively implement his fourth transformation of Mexico. It will be a referendum on the fourth transformation. It will be interpreted in that way. And it, it, this is a fact that's reinforced by an opposition campaign that is offering nothing new to voters. They're not offering a competing vision of Mexico, of Mexico's future, but, as, but instead, and as a result, implicitly promising to return Mexico to the pre Lopez Obrador state of affairs. So given these sharp divisions in the Mexican electorate, it's very unlikely the June 6th election alone will be able to resolve this dispute about the future of Mexico. The dispute will continue in the post-election period, in the days, weeks, and potentially months after the election in the form of widespread challenges to the election results. And in, after that, in a continuing battle between Lopez Obrador and the opposition to promote or constrain Lopez Obrador's fourth transformation policies. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, thank you also very much, uh, Professor Starr, for the stellar opener and uh, enormously useful, comprehensive um, and nuanced um, review of the two years and what's taken the current elections. And what I heard um, in your comments was uh, to some extent answers to what many of us were asking when President uh, Lopez Obrador was elected, namely, would he turn out the pragmatist uh, mayor of Mexico City or would he turn out uh, uh, the radical politician uh, that campaigned uh, uh, on significantly changing uh, the system. And uh, what we have been seeing is far more leaning toward um, uh, the radical transformation rather than uh, um, feeling constrained by some of the pragmatist policies that some were assuming he would bring uh, from his experience as uh, the mayor. Uh, Ambassador Saru Khan, um, let me turn to you and ask uh, you to um, help us look forward uh, under two scenarios. So assuming that uh, uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador and Morena will not be able to maintain uh, the hold on power that they have currently, they will lose the uh, absolute majority in the lower chamber as uh, Lorena um, outlined in her comments and likely not retain enough um, support in local uh, congresses uh, and uh, he is not able to uh, conduct the change of the constitution that he was hoping for. What kind of priorities and policies uh, are we likely to see and how that's going to uh, play? A and perhaps you can also entertain the other scenario that miraculously everything will still click into place in the last remaining days and um, uh, he will be able to uh, retain enough political power to make those changes. Um, uh, please, over to you. Thank you, Vanda. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to be with, with dear colleagues and friends um, uh, uh, discussing a, a critical moment in Mexico's contemporary uh, history and, and uh, a defining moment for Mexican democracy and for the Mexico-US relationship going forward, uh, which I will also talk about uh, uh, um, generally, at least in my opening remarks. Um, I, look, I, I, I fully agree with, with, with Pam when she says that, that this is a referendum on the fourth transformation and on Morena and on López Obrador, but what's I think very telling is that it has become a referendum, not because of the ability of the opposition, which I fully agree is completely um, uncoordinated, lacks a vision of an alternate vision of the country going forward with concrete policies, with compelling politicians. Um, it's become a referendum because Lopez Obrador has turned it into a referendum himself by inserting himself continuously 
in the electoral process and using his daily press briefers um, as, as sort of the, 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 the milestones of the narrative regarding the elections. And, and this in part explains why, you know, the question that so many analysts and, and the media and think tanks outside of Mexico and even inside Mexico are asking, you know, this Teflon coating that the president appears to have, despite the fact that if you look at, if, if you look at the president's personal approval numbers, but then you look at how people are responding, reacting to specific aspects of public policy, as Lorena said, whether it's uh, COVID, public insecurity, the economy and jobs, there's a big gap between the approval numbers that the president has and the approval of his specific policies. And so the big question going forward into the midterms was whether that gap, that difference that does exist uh, would, would, would help at least in some of the local and state rate races propel opposition candidates ahead of their Morena competitors. It seems to be happening in certain places, but at the end of the day, the resilience of, of President Obsorador's numbers is still grounded on, on what you know explains his landslide, landslide victory in, in 2018, which is, and you've studied this a lot, Vanda, um, and, and Tony saw it and was there. Um, in many countries around the world, societies, in some, in some societies, people think that corruption happens under the table. In some other countries, citizens believe corruption happens above the table. Well, in 2018, Mexicans believe that corruption in Mexico included the table. And that in many ways explains why there was this sort of fundamental rejection of the statu quo ante, and why despite the failings, the clear failings of the Lopes Obrador administration on a number of fronts most saliently public security, the handling of the pandemic, and the economic and social uh, uh, stimuli to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, why, why, despite all of this, you're not going to see a full-fledged collapse of Morena's numbers in the midterms. Yes, I, I, I fully concur with Lorena. I, I think that they will lose seats um, and, and um, that the, the battle will be in the narrative of the opposition and the president as to what the results mean and imply. The other thing that I think is clear is that regardless of what happens on June 6th, the president is going to double down. Whether, whether he can explain what happened as a victory and a ratification of the premises of the fourth transformation, or whether the opposition can push forward the narrative that voters have punished the president and Morena, I, I, I fear that the president is going to double down. You're not going to see more enlightened policies. You're not going to see a U-turn like Maggie Thatcher. The gentleman is not for turning, and I don't think you're going to see him uh, sort of recalibrate a lot of the positions that are creating concerns, both in Mexico and beyond, particularly if you look at the potential violations of Mexico's USMCA commitments. Um, and that, that, will be, that will be a very, very complex moment going forward because the president is going to do two things. He's going to start thinking of how he bulletproofs his legacy. And therefore, as Lorena said, you're going to see the lame duck dynamic kick in, I think, pretty early this time around. The jockeying between who in Morena can become the anointed heir to Lopes Obrador. Um, and, and unfortunately, at least if we use these midterms as a watermark, an opposition which still hasn't figured out what to do, and which is still not recovered from the walloping it took in the 2018 midterm election. So I, I, I do think that one of the things that you're going to see, Vanda, is a doubling down on many of the policies of the president. And I, I said it from the get go. Uh, in the 2018 election. I, I know that especially in a city like this in Washington and in the US, there was a lot of concern, valid concern, about the direction of the economic policies of the president. But at the end of the day, I always thought that the most complex and concerning issue 
regarding a Lopsorador presidency was going to be the whittling away of the checks and balances that has taken two, three decades to painstakingly build in Mexico. It's imperfect, but certainly if you look at the architecture of Mexico's democracy today and compare it to where it was three decades ago, two decades ago, Mexico has advanced and, and has, has, there have been significant strides. Um, and, and the signs that we've seen with the independence of the three branches of government, the breakdown in very important aspects of the federal pact in Mexico, um, the, the, the checks and balances, the role of NGOs, all of this is extremely concerning. And I think that this is where going forward, you will see some of the most trying and complex uh, uh, policies being enacted by the president. Let me very quickly before um, we, we head into uh, obviously Tony's remarks and then a general conversation amongst ourselves, let me put the issue of the US-Mexico relationship on the map. Um, I remember, I think Pam and I were in, were in a, another webinar like this somewhere else and and um we were discussing what the uh biden victory meant for us mexico relations and i i said you need two to tango or dan salsa or danzon or whatever you want to do in mexico and the question was not only not only how would the us administration engage with mexico but whether lopez obrador was willing to take advantage of the biden administration and the opportunity that that provided both countries to relaunch uh, and reset the bilateral relationship. Every sign is telling us that President López Obrador is itching for a fight with the U.S., and if not a fight, to be able to use the U.S. as he's used the media and NGOs and opposition figures in Mexico as, as, as a way to, to, to create the us versus them narrative. You've seen it most clearly with the president lambasting the US and US, USAID for doing something, which by the way, explains why he's president today, funding and supporting NGOs on the ground in Mexico, watchdogs on corruption, on transparency, on judicial reform, on human rights, that in many ways explain why he won in 2018. And, and this is this is this is troubling because we're a few days, a week and a half away from uh, Vice President Kamala Harris going down to Mexico. And the big question that I have is whether the U.S. isn't falling into a sort of Erdogan trap in its relationship with Mexico. You've all heard about uh, the the Tucidides trap regarding um, a, a status quo global power and a rising power and what that does to international relations. Um, I, I'm using this figure of the Erdogan trap because remember what happened when you had massive uh, numbers of Syrian and Middle Eastern refugees coming into the European Union, either across the Aegean, the Medi Mediterranean, or across Turkey's land borders. The European Union. Uh, work with Turkey to try and have Turkey stop those migrants from coming into the European Union. But sort of the unwritten quid pro quo was that the European Union would turn a blind eye to the erosion of Turkish democracy and the checks and balances in Turkey. In many ways, by having the Biden administration decide that ensuring Mexican collaboration on stopping the flow of Central American transmigration through Mexico, they, they've put everything else, at least temporarily, I hope, on the back burner because they need to ensure Mexican collaboration so that the GOP does not use migration and the border as a narrative to uh, uh, politically um, assault the Dems going into next year's midterms. But then all the other issues, with the timid exception of USMCA issues, which as a result of the Free Trade Commission last week, have now started to, 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 to start percolating upwards. It seems that the Biden administration isn't focusing on this erosion of democracy and of independent checks and balances in Mexico. And therefore, the big question is, is the Biden administration, despite the fact that they're engaging with a very prickly nationalist counterpart in Mexico, and they don't want to trigger that, um, whether down the road, the U.S. Isn't, uh, wouldn't need to recalibrate how it's engaging Mexico and Mexican society on these issues of the erosion of checks and balances 
and a strong liberal democracy, which is needed in Mexico. And I'll stop there. Oh, uh, perfect. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sarukan. Also enormously uh, informative uh, and insightful uh, comments and perfect transition to uh, Ambassador Wayne. Uh, uh, let me uh, post uh, to you the uh, uh, Arturo question. Is the Biden administration likely to recalibrate its relationship with Mexico after the midterms? And uh, are we likely going to see an enlargement of the uh, agenda? Um, we have seen um, uh, uh, quiet uh, engagement at best on issues of security, for example, despite the enormous rupture in the US-Mexico bilateral security cooperation that we have been experiencing in the last uh, few months, but preceding that uh, in the long buildup. Also, um, uh, Ambassador Sarukan spoke of a critical moment in the um, uh, course of Mexican uh, democracy. Uh, Professor Starr spoke about a uh, referendum on Mexico's future. Uh, to the, uh, in your view, um, Ambassador Wayne, um, is US foreign policy sufficiently aware of the uh, profound nature of these elections? And to the extent that it is, um, uh, does it have any uh, capacity to shape it? And should it have any capacity uh, or should it have any role in uh, shaping that? So uh, over to you, please. Tony, you're muted. Thank you, Vonda. And thanks, uh, Lorena, Pamela and Arturo for your excellent points. Um, I, I want to start off, however, saying a little something about the Mexican elections, and I'll get to your points, Wanda. I think it's really important just to underscore from what we've heard that in the last several weeks, AMLO's really laid it all out. There's a clear choice for voters. Anybody who's been listening to his morning press conferences and reading the articles and watching the newscasts, I mean, he's come out with a whole uh, display of his agenda. It's quite clear he's going to put a new central bank governor in who has heart. Uh, he's extended the Supreme Court chief justice for two years. Um, he's not only criticized all these various people, but he's promised to weaken the national electoral uh, institutions if he goes forward, as well as taking the others and putting them uh, into various ministries and parts of the government. Um, on energy independence, he's just become clearer and clearer as he has been in the last couple of days with the announcement of buying uh, the rest of this refinery in Texas, all portraying this and his two pre the two previous laws, which are now suspended by the court as really moving Mexico toward energy independence. He's used the WEF, the uh, Financial Intelligence Unit and the Attorney General's office to uh, go after political opponents in, in pretty uh, bold and aggressive ways. Uh, and, and as Arturo mentioned, he's criticized the United States for, su for supporting two NGOs who have a long and respected record of standing up for what they're supposed to do, looking at corruption critically, defending journalists. So it's pretty clear out there for anybody who has been listening to the news, this is a, he's made it into, to second one Arturo said, into a vote on, on his agenda. Um, I also agree with what Arturo said that he's gonna keep pressing forward with his agenda, no matter how the election comes out. But the election will of course determine the degree to which he has super momentum behind that as it goes forward. So what does the United States have to do in this situation? Um, they have to walk this line, which is a very careful line between the, uh, the deep tradition of suspicion in Mexico in defense of its sovereignty, vis-a-vis -vis the big neighbor to the North, and the important issues that the United States has with this very important neighbor, the largest you know, export part, uh, or one of the two largest export partners that the United States has and a, a tr tremendously important partner for all the things that cross the border, good and bad. Um, and how does it manage that? I think Artur is correct that the, the, the they've placed the highest priority in the short term on getting control of the migration situation. And they do need Mexico's help for doing that. 
Um, on the other hand, they have started raising their concerns on the economic front, uh, not just at this last meeting among the ministers, but in previous statements coming out of both USTR and Congress and the State Department um, about labor rights, about energy, the energy sector and respect for investors there. Um, there have been a number of groups in the United States, for example, in the agricultural sector, being very frank about things they think Mexico is not doing well. So that's, I think they're going to continue to look at that. And then on the security front, they did actually just have security consultations uh, 10, 10 days ago, the first in a long time. Now, as Vonda said, that's a really challenging area. And really, there's been no progress to speak of. There's been continued cooperation up until about a year ago. Um, it, it declined, or, or at the end of last year, it declined significantly. But there has not been any real improvements in that security cooperation in, in these recent years. So there's a lot to do there. And yes, this is going to take a careful calibration. Um, as we know by all of us living in Washington, we know the Biden administration has a tremendously full agenda and they only have a partially full staff. Uh, they don't have a lot of people confirmed. Um, they're, they're doing a lot. Um, they are working hard on this part of the world. Uh, I think they will uh, get there. And I think that includes being concerned about democracy. This is after all, one of the themes that by, that Vice President Biden, now President Biden, made clear was really important to him. And he does know Mexico well. He knows its strengths and its weaknesses um, better than, as, as Arturo has argued in other fora where we've been together, he knows it better than any other American president. And, and that is the case. Um, so he'll be looking for a way forward. But I think you're exactly right and we're exactly right in thinking that this is going to be a really delicate path in going ahead um, because you don't want to play into the hand of those people who would like to reach under the bed and pull out that old bogey uh, bogeyman image of the United States of imposing things on Mexico. I think there are enough stakeholders in Mexico and the United States who understand this relationship to help the government develop a more sophisticated effort to work on these issues, but it's going to take a lot of careful diplomacy and it is going to, to demand a lot of attention. Part of that we can also see, I think, if we can get it going between the two countries is recreating the institutions for dialogue that existed previously to help deal with some of these challenges. We used to have a high level economic dialogue that went beyond trade and looked at the other issues that were troubling the relationship. And, and Lopez Obrador agreed with Biden to reestablish that. That can be helpful. I think it is positive that they did have a bilateral dialogue on security um, within the last 10 days. That isn't gonna fix everything, but if you start talking about things, you can start exploring solutions. There's gonna be a lot more that needs to be done. Handling migration effectively is going to take a lot of practical cooperation, not just US-Mexico, but with partners to the South. So this will be hard slogging, um, but I, I think it is possible to manage this going forward. And I think at some points it's going to take the United States need to be, needing to be very frank when it has a disagreement. And as we've seen in a couple of relationships around the world, the Biden administration has been willing to do that, to speak frankly and still work with people to find ways forward. So let me stop there and let's get to some of the questions and answers. Great, um, thank you so much, um, Ambassador Wayne. Um, uh, calibration and, and careful tap dance to use uh, to follow up uh, Arturo's dancing metaphor seems to be the, uh, the need, uh, the direction in the US uh, Mexican relationship for the remaining three years and potentially much longer than uh, just that amount of time. And yet the, the, the gravity of the issues at stake uh, only seems to have been rising um, in the relationship. Uh, let me put two questions on uh, the table right now. Um, uh, Lorena, let me start with you and ask you about violence in the elections. Mexican elections are often violent. Um, often, you know, in the prior elections, we saw 100 plus uh, political candidates uh, at all levels of, of running for offices being assassinated, sometimes 
This is linked to um, uh, criminal groups uh, that are seeking to shape elections. We are seeing that certainly profoundly in the Tierra Caliente, but there is of course also a long history in Mexico of assassination of political opponents by their rivals. It's not necessarily linked or exclusively linked to, critic, to critical groups, to uh, criminal groups. So one question for you, what are we seeing in terms of patterns of violence, voter intimidation and, and uh, voter access? And uh, another question uh, to put right now on the table, and then I'll come uh, back to questions for uh, Tony and Arturo. Uh, Pamela, for you, you spoke about the weakness of the uh, traditional parties, pre-PAN and PRD, and really their inability to, uh, to put something new on the table for voters. Are we uh, at the point in uh, Mexican history where Mexico will follow the pattern of many countries in Latin America of seeing essentially the demise of political parties and instead elections take place uh, around particular politicians that create temporary political vehicles, but where the strength of parties uh, uh, that have, has long been characteristic of Mexican elections is going away. Uh, and and uh, related to that, what will it take for um, uh, parties like PAN, PRI, PRD to start listening to voters and put forth an agenda that simply let's not go back to what it used to be like? So let me start with those two questions and then I'll go to questions for Arturo and Tony. Thank you, Vanda. Yes, definitely uh, violence is one of the main issues, not only in elections, but for us uh, pollsters to measure uh, the vote intention it's a great challenge. Uh, for instance, in a specific area of Tierra Caliente in Michoacán, we cannot even go in uh, to, to, to ask respondents. And we have seen elections being turned around from something that you can you know, project as a potential winner just by the activity of criminal organizations in those areas, right? Um, we have seen that there's a project winner, a consensus and a projected winner. And that day, the activity of the organized crime can actually turn the election around. Um, and this is something that we have to contemplate in several states, uh, obviously Michoacán, Guerrero, Sinaloa, Durango, in a certain part of Sonora, right? So, so we, we have to factor that in into our measurements. We also see this um, on election day, Unfortunately, it has become a practice of some parties um, to motivate, uh, let's say, a criminal activity on the day of the election in order to dissuade voters in sections that are not favorable to them from coming out to vote. Um, so it's just basically, you know, provoking the abstention in those elections. And we have seen that it's more of a, it's, it's a common practice in certain areas, uh, more rural areas but we have seen that happen too. And unfortunately, um, the part about violence towards candidates has really not been under control. We have seen more than 30 candidates assassinated in this process to up to today. Um, and this is, this is a terrible news. And, and it's really just, it, it, um, it, has an, it has an effect on voters in terms of punishing the incumbent but it also has uh, an, an effect of not turning out to vote that day. So I don't think it's going to have the effect at the nationwide level, but we are going to see it in specific areas of this country and specific areas of some states. Can I, can I just very quickly a two finger on this, Vanda? Sure, please. Just, just to underscore that, that uh, the, the, these 32 candidates that Lorena mentions are 32 of 58 politicians who've been murdered uh, since the election formally kicked off in September of last year. And it's, and it's gonna become, after the 2018 election, the second most violent election in terms of deaths of candidates and politicians in Mexico's history. So that, that's something that we have to keep our eye on. Thanks. Please to you about political parties. Sure. Um... That's a $64,000 question, Vanda. <laughs> I could actually say a $64 million question. It's a tough one um, because we're seeing, I would argue, contradictory trends in Mexico. 
Um, you're seeing the trend where the um, these traditional opposition parties um, or the traditional parties of Mexico, not even opposition parties, the, the PAN, the, the PRI and the PRD have all been uh, unable to um, deal with the, the drubbing they took in 2018 and to find a way to communicate and talk with voters. And part of this is because Mexican politicians have never really communicated with voters. They've never had to. Um, the Mexican political system was always one in which um, your next position in politics was determined by your party, not by your constituents. There's also a very much an attitude in Mexico still in the Mexican political elite that the voters just aren't sophisticated enough to know what's right for them. So there isn't a need to listen to voters. And that's not unique to just the old uh, traditional parties. It's true of, of most of the politicians in Morena and the small parties as well in Mexico. So that tendency to pay attention to constituents, to listen to them, is not something that's well established in Mexico, either because of cultural reasons or because of how to get ahead in politics. Um, so that would suggest that these parties could potentially wither away and we would have a, a situation in which maybe parties don't matter in Mexico. But what we're seeing at the same time is that when individuals want to have an influence in politics, their first step is to try to form a party. Um, because parties receive all kinds of fundings from the Electoral Institute, and that gives enormous monetary incentive to form uh, parties. And at the same time, you have the Citizens Movement Party, which is insistent upon trying to create a third option, not a pro López Obrador, anti López Obrador, but a third way in Mexico. And finally, we don't have charismatic personalities in Mexico that could, at this point, that I see who, that could um, um, get, draw the voters fantasy. Um, so that's gonna be difficult to do. And finally, um, López Obrador is aggressively trying to undermine parties that don't support him, but aggressively trying to help parties that do support him. So it, it's not about eliminating parties from his perspective, it's eliminating those who oppose him. So sort of a, a, a complex milieu um, that will um, makes it difficult to determine what is the future of political parties in Mexico, but one in which politicians have never really listened to voters and they still don't really have a great incentive to listen to voters. Thank you. That's actually a perfect uh, transition to the question that I have for um, Ambassador Sarukan. Uh, but before I state it, I just want to let our um, uh, participants who are watching the webinar know that what I'm doing is uh, rolling in questions that have already been submitted or that are coming in live. So if you have more questions, please submit them through either Twitter or um, uh, the link stated in uh, the announcement and I'll continue folding them into the conversations as I've started doing already. Uh, so Arturo, um, Lorena in the beginning spoke about that this is the first time that uh, Mexican politicians can be reelected. A major new experience uh, and the, the change uh, in the system was that uh, hopefully uh, was motivated by, by the belief or by the, by the hope that politicians uh, would then start being reelected and elected on the basis of their performance as opposed to uh, their uh, party affiliation and they would become more responsive uh, to voters. So the questions to you is, uh, you know, what are the prospects for that? Um, this, the, the, the possibility of re-election has been long seen as the uh, a key um, mechanism of strengthening accountability. How do you see that uh, playing out? And Tony, let me put on also a question for you. So, you know, in the United States, we have gone through very traumatic four years uh, under President Trump, whose agenda was to weaken institution, destroy institutions, um, and uh, 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 use some of the whittling of the checks and balances that um, Arturo spoke about, do, do so in the United States. Um, and you have looked at issues of corruption, check and balances, power uh, division in many countries, in Argentina, in Afghanistan, in other places where um, um, you were posted and on whose policies, uh, on the US policy toward those countries, you had very significant influence. What do you see right now in Mexico as uh, some of the key levers for the remaining three years of the uh, Lopez Obrador administration 
to um, take on corruption, to take on impunity, even as uh, President uh, Lopez Obrador is perhaps targeting some forms of corruption, uh, highly politically motivated, as we sp uh, spoke about, and letting all kinds of impunity proceed. Arturo, let me start with you. Well, this, this, and, and this fits perfectly with, with what Pam was saying, because one of the reasons uh, th that explains the lack of responsiveness of, of Mexican political parties to citizens and constituents is precisely that until now, there was no re-election. So there was no incentive for a member of Congress, Senate or lower house, to be responsive to his or her constituents because he was in or she was in, and then you know she 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 couldn't face or he couldn't face re-election, and so the conveyor belt between citizens, uh, the stakeholdership conveyor belt between citizens and, and elected officials, did not exist. The 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 reform precisely sought to trigger that, um, but the question is, um, going forward, um, it. it if at the same time you're weakening Mexican institutions and you're weakening checks and balances, you're eliminating another one of the key pieces that ensures that those political parties stop being party party uh, crassies and and really start uh, responding to the demands of the voters. And and this again takes me to to what is my my core concern, which is the weakening of Mexico's institutional framework. Uh, because if the president persists in doing this, um, yes, his, his power is gonna be augmented as a result of that and the centralization of, of power in the executive. But that also means that he can't rely on institutions to generate growth, to mitigate the pandemic, to resolve so social conflicts, to tackle public insecurity, to take advantage of Mexico's geostrategic assets, or even facilitate uh, uh, the transition, which he hopes will be from one Morena candidate to another Morena candidate in 2024. And, and so th this again, it takes us back to the core question of what does this weakening of Mexico's democratic architecture mean? And it could have a detrimental effect precisely in terms of ensuring that via re-election, those members of Congress, those mayors, those um, governors, those elected officials become much more responsive and, and sort of rebuild, or in the case of Mexico, build a true conveyor belt between the aspirations and hopes and agendas of Mexican society and their, represent, uh, and their representatives in Congress or in state houses or in, or in municipal governments. And, and again, let, let me use an example of how all of this is playing out in terms of the US-Mexico relationship, because I'll, 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 if you look at three things that have been happening recently, these things are the direct result of a government that has cannibalized and destroyed Mexico's institutions and Mexican bureaucracy and Mexican uh, agencies immigration and the uh, imperious need for the US to have Mexico supported. In many ways, what's happening, regardless of the dynamics in Central America, is that the president has uh, cannibalized the budgets of Mexico's immigration and refugee agencies. They, they can't do what they're supposed to do if the numbers of agents, if the budget for those two agencies has been whittled away. Um, the president yesterday, the day before, was asking the U.S. not to downgrade Mexico aviation security. Well, one of the reasons that's happening is because the bureaucracy and the agencies that were supposed to be supervising air security in Mexico have been weakened. The recent U.S. ban on the exports of shrimp from the Gulf of Cortez to the United States are a direct result of the inability to enforce regulations uh, to ensure that there isn't bycatch of sea turtles in the Gulf of Cortez. And so, as you can as you can tell where I'm going, is that the weakening of Mexican institutions, the cannibalization of, of, of the Mexican state, of the Mexican state's capabilities, um, is, is truly having a detrimental effect 
on governance and public policy in Mexico in the same way that it could be counterproductive to what was behind the idea of finally um, enshrining re-election of public, uh, with the exception of the president, of uh, uh, public officials in Mexico. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I must say that I'm delighted that you brought in the issue of shrimp and seafood and, and far more um, potentially uh, dramatic uh, embargoes on uh, Mexican fisheries more broadly heading down from the United States yeah. as a whole set of reviews um, is underway, uh, emblematic both of some of the um, environmental policies, problematic environmental policies that Lopez Obrador has taken, but critically uh, the capacity to enforce uh, rule of law. And I would even say that what's uh, uh, you know, really characterized uh, the Lopez Obrador administration is not merely struggle with, with the capacity, but arguably uh, a lack of willingness uh, to take on politically controversial or significant security issues. So anytime um, major dramatic brazen uh, security incidents has happened, whether this was attacks against uh, significant uh, uh, government officials or um, angry Totoaberos, uh, uh, angry poachers of Totoaba burning down um, uh, ships of um, Semar, um, the response, the, 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 the directive uh, from the presidency is don't react, uh, don't, don't, just don't oppose, uh, which is an excellent transition to, um, uh, to you, Tony, uh, and uh, your reflections, please, on how can Mexico escape the culture and impunity? Uh, how can uh, uh, rule of law be promoted in the context uh, that we are in Mexico today? And are there lessons from other places where you served? Thank you very much, Fonda. So of course, there are, there are many people who are much more expert than I in fighting corruption, but I've concluded after serving in a number of places where corruption has been a problem, that you First, you really do need a coalition of people in the local society who want that corruption to change and are willing to struggle for that. And that's why having civil society organizations and NGOs is so important as part of the solution. And that's why doing away with them or criticizing them or making them into tame uh, little cute local organizations is not the way to go, even if they criticize governments, wherever they are. And then beyond that, you need business organizations and others willing to struggle for rule of law. And, and then you do need action by governments. But part of the challenge has been that you need to get this balance right. It is good to have leaders who are willing to uh, push forward anti-corruption agendas that actually press to have cases brought and examined and have convictions against corrupt individuals, but it needs to be done through institutions. If you rely on a, a savior leader to do these kind of things, it just, it's not going, probably not going to work and probably not going to last. Uh, what we, if we just look around the world and look historically, it's where through the sort of the, the difficult maneuvering within domestic politics in various places where structures have been built, built and survived that you have the best systems. And so that's where I agree fully with Arturo here in my worries that by tearing down systems that were already in place and checks and balances, you're just going to make it harder for Mexico uh, to move forward in a democratic fashion. Um, and you know, those in, I don't want to pretend that those institutions were all perfect. They weren't perfect, but people working really hard to get them to be better. I mean, you even saw in the anti-corruption area, there was a massive reform passed during the previous presidency that was never implemented fully under that presidency and then never implemented under this presidency going ahead. And uh, so it, it, it really does take a balancing between the recognition of the importance of institutions, whether they be in a government or in the civil society going forward and a leader that can champion reform while recognizing that you do have to have these processes, structures and mechanisms that help that reform go forward and be sustained. 
And I think that is one of the big issues before Mexico broadly right now. And I understand that that's not something that all Mexicans will see and grasp as they look at this situation. But coming from experiences elsewhere in the world and thinking about that, I, I do see this, this uh, the months ahead and the years ahead for Mexico in, in that lens. There's been a tremendous amount of progress this century in Mexico in strengthening and building democracy. And yes, that does need to expand to include the poorer people in Mexico in a more effective way. Um, but I'm worried that, that this is gonna be really challenging going forward. And that will make it challenging for the US-Mexico relationship um, in the longer period of time. Um, and it's not you know, fully admitting the problems and challenges that we have in the United States, having just grappled with and still grappling with a lot of these of these same issues, um, but it's, it will be much better if we're each, I think, struggling to move in a more democratic direction. Well, thank you, Tony. I'm glad that you brought up the not implementation of the uh, anti-corruption uh, agenda from the uh, Peña Nieto administration and its non-implementation so far. Now, I was going to uh, raise that. I've written in my own writings and thinking about corruption that uh, uh, what is critical is powerful political, a uh, powerful coalition of power that wants to implement anti-corruption agenda. But what then needs to happen is that this tool of political convenience uh, becomes translated into institutional habit. And uh, what we are in fact seeing in Mexico is efforts to weaken uh, the buildup of even small amount of the institutional um, habit. Lorena, let me uh, come back to you and, and pose two questions to you and I'll uh, also uh, overlap them a little bit with um, Pamela's. Uh, you know, um, I, I go back to the theme that this election is really significant. Uh, this is midterms. Uh, people perhaps uh, abroad are not so focused on the elections in Mexico. It doesn't seem prima facie as exciting as presidential election. And yet we have heard over and over that these elections are really about critical uh, issues in, in Mexico, critical moment. Uh, it's about future of Mexico. Uh, to what extent, uh, is my first question, to what extent are Mexican voters aware of that? Um, so yes, you know, they are voting uh, AMLO's transformation, yes or no. This is the extent of vote about the policies that, um, that Les and Lopez Obrador has put forth. Uh, but is, is there real awareness of the dramatic long-term impact? That's my question number one for you. The second question, which is also the same question that I want to pose to Pamela is, what are we seeing in the governor's races? Um, what are the exciting trends there, a key states to pay attention to? And, and Pamela, to you, um, at the level of the, the governor's races, um, can we see the emergence of new exciting uh, political, uh, exciting politicians or, or perhaps political op opposition um, uh, from the governor's races from the state level? Okay, thank you. So, um, well, we have to think about the Mexican electorate as a, a sort of a collage of different voters, right? Um, so, so, so different voters focus on different things, and, and this is clearly the nature of, of Mexico because it's such a heterogeneous country. What we have seen, though, is that there is an opposition forming against López Obrador at the national level. It seems to be stronger in some states, and uh, right now, when you see national surveys, around 30% of the population would say that they consider themselves anti Lopez Obrador, right? So these are voters that are more attentive to defeating Morena. They are more um, attentive to maybe uh, exercising a, a utility vote, you know, even if it's not the candidate of their preference to vote for the candidate that can defeat Morena. And this opposition has doubled over, over since Lopez Obrador started, right? When, when he started his term, this was around 12 to 15% of the voters. Now we can estimate it's around 28 to 30% of the voters. So those are the population, those are the voters that are seeing this election as critical. And they are very attentive to the elections of the lower house because they think that this is going to be definitive 
for the future of our country. Because if, they, if Lopez Obrador becomes strengthened from this election, in their view, then in 2024, we're going to have continuity from Morena. And they see it as a regression in the country, and they see it as a complete dismantlement of checks and balances, of independent institutions, et cetera, right? But we do have 40% of voters that are still strong Lopez Obrador supporters. And most of these are older voters. They are mostly in the South and Southeast of the country. A lot of these uh, receive social benefits from Lopez Obrador. But, and, and this is important, only of 25 to 30% of the voters say they are Morena supporters, right? So this is a gap between Lopez Obrador and Morena. And those 15% of the voters in the difference between Morena and Lopez Obrador are anywhere from PAN to PRI to Movimiento Ciudadano or the Citizens Movement, which is, as Pamela said, is, is, is trying to present itself as, as a third way. Um, and Movimiento Ciudadano is, is attracting all, all of these voters who are disillusioned with democracy in general, with the previous party system, and particularly with state and local governments that that made all these promises of change and honesty and ended up being dysfunctional and corrupt, right? So we only see like a 30% of the electorate seeing this as a definitive election. Um, in terms of the state elections, I think we, when we started this, this, this electoral process, many of the pollsters were giving 14 out of the 15 states to Morena, right? Only Querétaro was the one that they were, they were saying that was not going there. Um, we weren't polling at that time. Now that we have started polling, we are seeing very important um, changes in the states. For instance, Nuevo León, which is a very important state. Morena, who started out with a leading candidate, dropped to fourth place. Campeche, for instance, that was supposed to be a state where Morena could win, is now a possibility for Movimiento Ciudadano with a candidate with an ex-panista. Um, we are seeing Sinaloa and Sonora competitive. We are seeing Chihuahua. That was a state that should have gone to the PAN. Uh, that might go to Morena precisely because the governor, the PAN governor, is operating against the PAN candidate. We are seeing Michoacán and Guerrero, where the two Morena candidates that were leading in the polls were uh, removed by the Electoral Institute for not complying with law. Um, so we are seeing all of these important trends. And then and that's why I was underscoring the, the, the local factors at play and how, how much the, the, the people pay attention, the voters pay attention to these local dynamics. Thank you, Pam, please. Let me follow in on that. Because um, I think that what Lorena, the point she's making, and, and I think somewhat inadvertently when she's talking about the, the changes in positions of candidates and uh, the internal party disputes ab uh, about candidates is sort of what I'm seeing at, the, at the, the gubernatorial level and even at the national level is there aren't a lot of exciting politicians. There are a handful. Um, and the handful that seem to be they could be an exciting op option for the future potential candidate, um, 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 they're, how can I put this? Those that are in the opposition are the targets of, of Lopez Obrador. He's doing everything he can to try to weaken them. He's focused on uh, Enrique Alfaro in Jalisco, who has uh, been a fairly success successful governor despite the security situation for uh, Movimiento Ciudadano. Um, he's gone after the governor of Tamaulipas um, because he's taken the lead in uh, um, uh, uh, an opposition movement of, of of particularly panista governors, but opposition governors, um, as, 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 as I believe it was Tony who mentioned, using the power of the state to try to undermine him and indeed to arrest him and throw him in jail. Um, so it's very hard um, to be able to, for politicians, to, for particularly the opposition, to come out of the states. Um, and within Morena, it's going to be whoever López Obrador anoints. So yes, you've got a very strong governor in Claudia Scheinbaum in Mexico City, who could, is exciting. She's an interesting future politician, but she's also, you have Marcelo Obrador, the foreign minister, who's a potential candidate. You have other wannabes within Morena, but at the end of the day, the Morena candidate is going to be the person who's anointed by López Obrador. Those those circumstances makes, make it very hard for exciting candidates to come out of the states. And I frankly don't see that as the, 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 um, the path for a potential future president of Mexico, unless it happens to be Claudia Sheinbaum. 
I'm, I'm sorry, Vanda, if I can just um, add up to that. Um, I, I have a, just a, a different point of view in that because we are seeing that a, lo a lot of the local figures are becoming very important front runners for, for, for uh, opposition parties. Like for instance, Mauricio Vila in, in Yucatan, you see a lot, Cabeza de Vaca, for instance. So you, you do see a lot of local figures that are so strong in their states and that they have uh, performed well and that they have managed to fend off Morena that you can see some of these uh, candidates become exciting candidates. So, okay, maybe not the best uh, proposals, but exciting candidates. Um, Samuel Garcia in Nuevo León, which is why he's moving up in the, in the, in the polls. Um, and I think that there is where we're going to find the opposition candidates or the opposition front runner for 2024. Uh, thank you both for that um, exchange and those uh, very valuable insights, uh, Pamela and Lorena. Uh, we are five minutes to closing. Uh, let me uh, ask the last question to our two ambassadors, Ambassador Sarukan and Ambassador Wayne. You managed the US-Mexican relationship, but uh, in your work as ambassador and subsequently, you've also uh, been very engaged in the broader uh, relationship outside of the diploma, outside of the formal diplomatic channel, the track to the role of uh, the business community, uh, perhaps state-to-state uh, -state relations, uh, uh, communities uh, that have families on both sides of the border. What do you see as possibilities for some progress in um, key issues, whether we are talking about corruption, rule of law, easing some of the challenges, expanding the agenda of the bilateral relationship in uh, for the next uh, three years, for example, or, or perhaps through the end of the uh, Biden administration. If I can uh, ask uh, both of you to take about two minutes on uh, arguably much more complex question. Yeah, that, that, that question um, would merit a one hour discussion here, but I'll, I'll try to be as cryptic and brief as possible. I, I, think, I think one of the most fundamental things that needs to happen is that um, we, we need to tune out Washington DC and Mexico City. I'm, I'm not saying that the federal governments are irrelevant. This sounds weird from a guy who spent 23 years of his life as a career diplomat and career ambassador, but increasingly, I think it's the mayors and the governors of the United States and Mexico that need to play the leading role in creating trans-border engagement. Because, first of all, because that, that's where, again, going back to this idea of why the conveyor belt between society and politicians and political parties is broken in Mexico, the, if you, the, the closer you go to the ground, as Lorena said, you look at the role that some mayors are playing in Mexico, certainly a lot of them in the United States, um, if you can connect cities, and I'm not just talking about those cities on the border, because when, when you start talking about mayors and governors, everyone automatically tends to think of, oh, the border states. No, this has to be much deeper. It has to, it has to be driven by those states and those cities in the United States that may be far away from the border, but that, that play a key role whether it's in trade relationships and economic relationships and supply chains in diaspora communities. Um, and, and I see the role of mayors and governors uh, as the driving force of the rethinking, not only of the institutional framework, but the dynamics of the US-Mexico uh, bilateral relationship. And I think there are mayors and governors on both sides of the border, again, not only on the border, that understand this, the problem is, how do you create the framework for them to start engaging and to understand that diplomacy is no longer the sole purview or the monopoly of the federal governments in Washington, D.C. and Mexico City? Yeah, so just building on what Arturo had to say, I think uh, the, the, I agree fully with what he said. The question is the framework, and I don't think the framework is going to happen unless we at least get the agreement of the national governments to have this forward-looking yep. discussion take place with all the many stakeholders that there are in the, in the, in the public sector at, at subnational levels and in the private sector and, and really allow that to happen. And it needs to be a future-oriented dialogue, thinking if you look at USMCA, for example, there's all sorts of material in there to open up the future of where the economies go, how they become more competitive if you let the stakeholders take them there. 
Similarly, on you know migration, we all know that the real solution here is medium and long term, and that means thinking big picture, thinking five, 10 years down the line and start working in that direction. And similarly in security, uh, Vonda, you and I wrote four years ago with some others about the need really to reinvent the Merida cooperation. That still needs to happen. It has not happened up until now. Uh, and that is touching all of these cities and states that Arturo talks about. Think of all the human suffering on both sides of the border because of this drug trade that's going on it's just, and, and all the violence that comes out of it. It's just horrible. So we need to find a way to get these dialogues going, even as the governments are going to be wrestling with managing these relations, and it, you know, which will be challenging. But beside that, you can have these kind of dialogues looking out, what should we be doing for one and two and five years down the road? And, and, and why not get that going? And part of that could also be if we can get this North American leaders meeting set again and start thinking bigger about North America. That might help to get the U.S. and Mexico out of the just U.S. and Mexico look at the, at the short term. So there are a number of things we can do, and I hope we can uh, move forward to do that with help from people on both sides of the border and from our Canadian neighbors. Oh, thank you, Tony. Those are excellent uh, concluding remarks. Um, you know, my own concern about Mexico is one of seeing the weakening of rule of law, the progressive weakening of rule of law and the destruction of institutions. But I also have similar concern about failure of the agenda to, uh, in, to expand the inclusiveness of the economic and political system in Mexico. And uh, the issues uh, that uh, uh, th this expansion of the political and economic inclusiveness, the need to um, take much better uh, care of Mexican poor is a vital agenda that Lopez Obrador put uh, on the table that every Mexican politicians and citizens should be concerned about. Although it's very unfortunate in my view, the way he has chosen to attempt to advance many of those policies that have been very problematic. And uh, one of my fears is that uh, his, uh, his anti-institutional agenda will succeed, but the substantive agenda will actually fail. And that, um, that will also sour other political actors, parties and politicians to, to take on the agenda, even as vital as it is. Something that we have seen in the security space where um, the failures of policies have led toward apathy and just allowing critical, really intolerable levels of violence that no society, no country should be willing to put up with uh, and should constantly be paying attention to how to get at them. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Wayne. Thank you, Ambassador Saru Khan, uh, Professor Starr and Dr. Becerra for your uh, extraordinarily insightful, comprehensive remarks. This has been a terrific uh, conversation from my perspective. As always, I learned a tremendous amount uh, from you. Thank you very much to our audience for joining in today and uh, participating. And I look forward to a further conversation uh, with uh, under the rubric of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and other Brookings work. Thank you, Vonda. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.